Um, so warm up typically is just um, a warm up is to get your body warm. It's there to make sure that you're ready for exercise and to prevent in injury. Should be about five to 10 minutes long. And typically is whole body light exercise. So if you're gonna run for the day, doing a light jog could be a warm up, right? It's anything that's gonna use all the muscles that we typically are gonna use for that day's exercise. And we're just doing it at a very light intensity. So if we're walking, well, a light walking could be part of your warm up, right? Or maybe biking or just something that's getting you moving. So things like jumping jacks or jumping in place, anything that gets your body warm um, and moves it through a full range of motion. Um, realize some people like to stretch with a warm up, but we want to avoid things like static stretches. So a static stretch is a stretch where you stay still. So think about like touching your toes. That's a static stretch. We don't want to do those during uh, warm ups. We're very likely to injure ourselves and it will actually make you a make you worse at whatever you're going to do. So think about if you were going for a run, if you do static stretches like leaning down and touching your toes and holding it there, um, that is actually going to make you run slower. Do what? Why? Because it pulls those muscles apart um, and so it, it makes them not work as efficiently because of the way it pulls them apart and just holds them there. Um, and so there are things we can do to stretch though that would be beneficial and so what we have is dynamic stretches. And so this would be instead of reaching down and touching your toes, doing a toe kick where I'm kicking up and trying to touch my hand. It's the same stretch, stretching the same muscles, but there's movement happening. And so we're not worried as much about injuring ourselves and hurting performance. Does that make sense? Right? Cool down, the goal of a cool down is literally to cool your body down, to bring your heart rate down, to get it cooler. Um, typically we do this after a workout. It's to prevent injuries and bring the body back down to rest. Um, it's again five to ten minutes long. Um, this is where we would do our static stretches and just reduce intensity slowly. Okay, so instead of just stopping exercise, we want to slowly go down. So if we were running, we just slow that intensity down um, nicely. The true goal of a cool down is to get your heart rate below 100 beats per minute. That's the most effective cool down when it's that low. Um, that's not always possible or practical, but it's the true goal of a cool down. What's the one thing you should avoid doing? during a cool down. So we should never just stop completely. You shouldn't get done with exercise and just like sit or lay down or just stand there. Um, that's very bad for our bodies uh, because what happens is when you exercise, you've got blood moving through your entire body. And let's say, this is my favorite thing to do when I exercise, but I shouldn't, is I just like to lay down. Like as soon as the exercise is over, I just want to lay down on the ground. But what happens is, is the blood was moving through my body and when I stop, that blood is still trying to move through my body but can't as well because your muscles aren't helping it move. And so all of your blood starts going to, towards your feet, starts pulling in your legs. And eventually there's blood, there's not enough blood getting back to the heart. And so your heart doesn't get fully full, filled with blood and tries to contract and this can actually damage the heart over time. So you wanna make sure that you keep moving. It's gonna keep your heart healthy and you healthy as well. Does that make sense? Right, not too bad. So the next thing we wanna talk about is progression. So when you start cardio respiratory endurance exercise of any type, the goal hopefully is that you're gonna get better at it over time, right? So how do we make sure that we continue to get better at things or what should we look at? Well, when it comes to building cardio respiratory fitness, we always wanna make sure that you start slow. Start slow and build up slowly. Even if you think you can do more, sometimes it's better off not to do more in the beginning. So what I'm saying is imagine I haven't exercised for uh, let's say six months a year. And I'm like, I'm gonna go on a run. Like, I wanna start running. And so today I go on a run. And my goal for today is to just simply run, jog, walk a mile, right? So if I was to walk, jog a mile today, um, it probably wouldn't be too bad. I'd get to the end of that mile and I'd be like, okay, I'm good. And so maybe it went so well, I'm like, you know what? Maybe I'm gonna try to go for a second mile, right? I'm feeling so good, I might as well do two miles, right? And maybe I get through that one, I'm like, you know what? Let's do another half mile. So I did two and a half miles when the goal was to actually only do a mile. Does that make sense? When I wake up tomorrow, how am I gonna feel? Probably pretty sore, right? I'm not gonna feel that great because it's been a while. And so if I'm really sore tomorrow, am I likely to exercise? No. Probably not, probably not. And so instead of doing a mile today and a mile tomorrow, well, I did two and a half today and only, and I did nothing tomorrow, right? Now, if you guys have ever worked out, the first day after exercise is pretty rough, but what about two days after exercise? All of you went, ooh, because you know it's worse, right? Like you're even more sore two days. 
So if, am I likely to exercise two days from now if I get really sore? Probably not. And so what's happened is all of a sudden, because I did two and a half miles thinking I was doing something good, it's now led to me exercising less, right? And so I would have been better off just doing that mile. Even if I feel good, we're going to hold off. We'll do another mile tomorrow and another mile the next day and then slowly work our way up from there. So we're more consistent in that. Um, as we are building up cardiorespiratory endurance, we have to change parts of that FIT principle, okay? Parts of that FIT principle. It could be the time, it could be what we're doing, it could be the intensity. The key with it is, is as we're increasing, we only want to change one component of the FIT principle at a time. And most of us think this is pretty common sense. If I ran one mile, or so if I ran 20 minutes, three days a week this week, right? At maybe a moderate intensity, I don't want to next week start running five days for an hour at a very high intensity, right? It's too much. You wouldn't be able to do it. So just changing one thing. So maybe adding a day or adding a little bit of time or changing the intensity. And regardless of what you're doing, something in your workout has to change every two weeks. Could be how many days you're doing it. It could be the intensity. It could be the time. Something has to change every two weeks. Because after about two weeks, you're no longer seeing improvements. You all know, you all drive like a pretty consistent pattern. I, I know you guys do. Um, you all have that one person that you see like, there's like a time clock when they run. You know what I'm talking about? Like you're driving and they're always in the exact same outfit, in the exact same spot at the exact same time. Like if they're at that intersection at noon or they're at that intersection and you need to be there at like noon, you're like, oh crap, I'm late because they're past that intersection already. You know what I'm talking about? That person who runs the same thing over and over again, you might not, like, there are people that run the exact same way, the exact same time every single day. Those people aren't seeing improvements because they're not changing up their workout. Yes? By change, do you mean, like, any change at all? Like, like weight or, like, what workout you're doing? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, just something has to change. So, theoretically, if I run a mile on the exact same track, like, let's say I ran a mile down the hallway, just back and forth down the hallway every single day. I do that for two weeks, I'm going to see improvements in my cardiorespiratory fitness. If I keep doing it after that point, I'm just staying the same. Now, I could easily change it by just going to a different location where maybe there's some elevation, right? If I start running up and down a hill somewhere, that's changing that workout. It doesn't have to be crazy, just something small has to change in order for us to continue to see improvements. Make sense? Cool. Um, Another way that we can look at maybe modifying or doing something different when it comes to cardiorespiratory endurance exercise would be HIT training. Do you guys know what HIT stands for? High intense. Yeah, high intensity. Something, something. Oh. High intensity. It's another I. This is spelled correctly. I know. It kind of looks weird. There's two I's in it. I think so. Anybody? Just take a stab at it. Okay, the first two. It's the last two words. High intensity. It's even the last word. Okay, he's he's trying, he's trying, I like it. So it's high intensity interval training. High intensity interval training. So high intensity interval training is exactly what, you're gonna do exactly what it is in the name. You're gonna do a really high intensity in an in interval. So an interval means a set of time going back and forth. And so you're gonna do something at a really high intensity, basically as hard as you possibly can. And then you're gonna have a period where you do it at a little bit lighter of an intensity, so a lower intensity. And you're gonna train back and forth. So you're gonna maybe sprint 100 yards and then walk 100 yards and then sprint 100 yards and walk 100 yards, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so what's allowing us to do is work out at a very high intensity, but in these interval styles so that we can do it for a longer period of time. Does that make sense? The advantage to a, high, a HIIT training workout is you can get a very good workout in in a very short amount of time. So the benefits you might see from a workout of jogging for 30, 40, 45 minutes, even maybe an hour, you could maybe have completed and getting the same benefits from and doing a 20, 25 minute high intensity interval workout. Does that make sense, right? So you can get the benefits in a shorter amount of time and that seems appeasing to everyone. I have to work out less, but you have to be willing to push yourself as hard as possible in order to get those benefits. If you don't push yourself as hard as you can during those high intensity portions, well, you've just shortened your workout. 
Does that make sense? Right? And so there's lots of different ways. Realize HIIT training is not for everyone because maybe you don't want to push yourself that hard, but it can be for some people. We could do it based on distance. So that kind of run 100 yards, walk 100 yards, that type of thing would be there, kind of distance related. It could be repetitions. Some people on a bicycle will say they're going to pedal as hard as they can for 100 pedals, right? Just one, two, three, as hard as they can. And then they're going to go slower for maybe 50. Does that make sense? Right, just kind of counting those out. Um, we can also change the intensity of the lower intensity portion. So imagine I'm sprinting 100 yards, right? And I was walking 100 yards after that and then sprinting again. Well, imagine if I turn my walk into a jog. Would that make the exercise a little bit more difficult? Yeah, right? That low intensity portion is not quite as low. And we can also do this through rest. So we can change the resting component, so the, the lower intensity portion of this. We're talking about cardiorespiratory endurance. The rest isn't just sitting still. We're doing something. But we can change that portion. So imagine I'm going to, again, on a football field, run 100 yards and then walk 100 yards. How can I make that where it's harder for me to accomplish by just changing the low intensity portion. So I'm going to run 100 yards every time. But how can I make it more difficult by changing that walking portion? Instead of walking, jogging. Okay, we could walk and jog. That could be one of it. Instead of walking, we jog. Definitely. Um, how could I do it with still walking? Maybe I still want to walk. I don't want to jog. How could I make it more intense? Instead of running the sprint. Well, we're going to run. That's what we mean. Running as fast as we can. We're going to do that, but just the rest portion. So just that low intensity portion. You can do a burpee or something. Do what? Do it uphill. We could do that. So I'm trying to think of how can we do it the simplest way instead of changing like what we're running on. Again, football field, think that. We could do high knees. Yeah. We could do a push up every five yards. You guys are getting really like, this is awesome, like great things to do. I was thinking very simple. Instead of walking 100 yards, I could just walk 50 yards, right? Like I could run 100 and then walk 50 yards and that's gonna make it a lot more difficult than if I walk 100, right? Because at the end of 50 yards, I'm gonna have to run again. Does that make sense? You guys following on that, right? So again, all those things you guys said are correct. There are lots of different ways to do it. Do you see that? Like there are all kinds of ways that we can do that. If we wanna make it easier, how can I make that easier? Instead of walking 100 yards, what can I do to make it easier? Walk 200 yards, right? It doesn't have to be complex. It could be. It could be walking downhill. It could be, uh, you know, like, I don't, I don't know, like drinking water after 100. I don't know, stopping, but that's not as good. We want to keep moving. But you see how that can change, right? Cool. So finally, when it comes to building cardiorespiratory endurance, you may and hopefully you will achieve your goals at some point, right? Whatever your goal is, with cardiovascular endurance, we're, you're gonna achieve that, that is the hope. And so you may eventually move into more of a maintenance stage when it comes to exercise, where you just simply wanna maintain what you've built up. Maybe it's a really tough semester at school and we don't want you just to stop. We don't want you to stop and lose all the benefits you had. And so when it comes to maintenance of keeping what you've already worked so hard for, is you wanna simply just continue to do activity three days a week. You want to continue to do activity three days a week. As long as you do something three days spaced out throughout the week, you're going to maintain exactly kind of where you're at or what you built up. Does that make sense? Right? We're not seeing improvements, but we're keeping them. Um, the other thing is, is, yes, maintaining and doing it three days a week is good, but we typically want to see you continue to build your cardiorespiratory fitness, continue to make improvements. And so we can always set new goals. Set new goals would be a new th a thing that's going to keep us there. If we're continuing to set goals, we're going to continue to get better and maintain what we can already do. We can cross train. So cross training is where maybe we do a different activity. So maybe I got really good at running, right? Maybe I became a good runner and I'm just tired of running, right? Well, if you worked all that hard for all the, you know, being able to run a marathon in an hour, right? Maybe let's say that's you, that's impossible, but let's say that's you, right? You don't want to give that up, right? But maybe you're just tired of running, so you can do a different activity. You can start biking. And as you, as you start biking and you do bicycling, that's actually going to help you stay a decent runner. Does that make sense? Because you're still building those things. Your body's not just going to forget how to run, but it's not running itself, right? Or maybe you get good at biking and you get good at running, and so then you start swimming. Well, that's going to help you be good at both of those, right? Maintain that fitness you built doing both of those things. You guys following? 
right? So this is kind of how the, the triathlon got started. Someone got really good at running and then decided to bike and got really good at that and decided to swim and then put all three together, right? A triathlon is simply swimming, biking, and then running in that order always, right? I want to make a, a different marathon. We'll call it the J-Ho Marathon, and I want to make it a little bit more interesting, okay? If you've ever watched a, a triathlon, it's not that exciting. My marathon, same thing. We're still going to run bike and swim but we're just going to do them in a different order than what a traditional one has done i'm going to make you run first and then bike and then i'm going to put the swim at the very end okay the swim always comes first because you want the most energy to make sure because you're in some pretty deep water i want the swim to come last and there to be no lifeguards on duty and you've got to think yeah yeah i see your face i want you to think like do i have enough energy to make it right because the last thing you want to do is get halfway out there and be like, uh-oh, bad idea, right? Like, I want to make it intriguing. People would be like, oh, the style I've got, don't do it, yelling at a guy. You're not ready for that, right? Like, that would be an exciting trap on. You know what I'm saying? Right? The key with all of this when it comes to maintenance, no matter which of these you choose, is we, it, the whole reason we do maintenance, besides keeping your cardiovascular endurance, is simply to prevent you from getting injured. We want to prevent injury in the future. Okay, and this comes by continuing to do some activity. So, did anyone ever do activity like maybe play a sport or were pretty active in high school? Yeah, a few of you, I see that, right? So, we have this. So, let's imagine I didn't, but let's imagine that I played soccer pretty competitively in high school. Okay, so let's say I played soccer pretty competitively in high school, and back in high school, I could do what's called a bicycle kick. Do you guys know what a bicycle kick is? That's where a ball's coming at you, like at your face or whatever, and you do a backflip in midair and try to kick the ball like way over your head and like hopefully get it into the goal, right? Maybe land on your feet, but at least not hurt yourself when you land, okay? Imagine I could do one of those really well in high school, okay? And then I moved to college, and when the first year or two of college, maybe I still played soccer a good bit, right? Like got together with people, played soccer, whatever, like had fun. But typically as we move throughout, schooling we get a little less active right so maybe senior junior year of college i played a little less right and then i got out of college and so it was time for me to start a career and so i kind of just put soccer to the side and i stopped really exercising which is not uncommon for most college students you get your job and you're trying to work your way up and and improve and get better at skills and so you just stop exercising and so life goes on for maybe 10 15 years and 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 whatnot maybe you have family maybe whatever you've worked at your job and um, you're with a group of buddies, and all of a sudden they're like, hey, I know you've talked about playing soccer in high school. So did I. They've got this new adult soccer league starting up in a couple months, right? And so you and people that haven't exercised, maybe you're like 35, 40, and you haven't exercised in 10, 15 years, you're like, let's sign up, right? And so you're a bunch of grown adults put their name on this adult soccer league, and they're so excited, right? They're like practicing in their backyard, like having tr you know, like practices beforehand, and they get out there to that first game, Right? And so they're playing soccer, they're feeling great about themselves, and let's say I'm out there, right, and it's been a long time since I've exercised, and all of a sudden in the middle of that game, that ball's coming at my head, right? And all of a sudden I'm like, oh, the heyday, right, the glory, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show everyone up here, and what am I going to try to do? I'm going to try to do that bicycle kick. I'm going to jump up and try to kick it behind my head and like get the game-winning goal, right? Now, I'm going to jump, and I'm going to start trying to do that backflip with my head, and then all of a sudden I'm going to realize, huh, I don't know if I can do this anymore, right? I thought I could. I thought I could because the last time I did one, I was great at it. But what's happened to my body over the last 15 years? It's, reg it's regressed, right? I'm not as strong anymore. And so all of a sudden, I'm going to wind up like hurting myself, landing on my head or something else because I didn't have enough muscular strength to do so. Does that make sense? If I would have maintained doing some type of exercise, one of two things would have happened. Either A, I would have known that I couldn't do it and wouldn't have tried, or B, maybe I would have maintained the strength and actually been able to do it. Does that make sense? Believe it or not, so right now, a bunch of adult top leagues are starting up. Softball, soccer, football, all kinds of adult leagues are starting up at different sports. Guarantee you in the next few weeks, as those actually get underway, you're going to see doctor visits for 30 to 40 year old men go through the roof for injuries related to exercise. It's, it's, it really happens. Um, the reason I use soccer as an example is there was actually, as I was in college, an adult soccer league that started. Okay, And I knew a bunch of older guys at the time and they said, hey, you want to come out and help us? And I was like, sure, I'll come play like you know, with a bunch of you guys. It'll be fun. Um, no lie. No lie. We were out there for the first game. Ref blows the whistle. Okay, for the for for the ball to start, 
got, they start kicking it around. Guy way over here, not even close to the ball, his name was Ronnie, okay? Ronnie, all of a sudden, like, takes a couple steps and goes down. He's like, ah! He literally blew out his ACL. Didn't even touch the ball, okay? <laughs> blew out his ACL. Wow. Oh, it all, now, that's a weird kind of freak thing, but Ronnie would have admitted at that time he didn't do a ton of exercise to kind of get ready for that, and so maybe it would have been less likely if he would have continued to do exercise. So the next week I came out there and we were playing and as soon as the, uh, the ref blew the whistle, I just went down because Ronnie was there in support. I went, oh, I pulled a Ronnie, my knee. I didn't, but it was just good fun to poke fun at him for sitting on the sidelines in a big knee brace. Does that make sense, right? So we always want to make sure that we continue to do activity. So from there, the last thing we want to talk about in this chapter is safety. Safety. What, what are some of the things we need to consider when it comes to safety? Well. Two of the things we need to consider, especially here in Georgia, is we really have to consider the heat if we're exercising outside. If you're inside, hopefully it's not like, hopefully the heat and the cold aren't that big of a deal inside. But outside, especially in Georgia, heat can be a big thing. Even maybe like in a day or two. I know it's like 40 degrees outside now, but it might be 100 next week. And so um, when it comes to heat, the biggest thing we're worried about is your body getting too hot. Your body wants to stay a very um, specific temperature. And so the way our body keeps us from getting too hot is through sweating. It's the most effective way for you guys to stay cool is through sweating. All of you are sweating right now, even sitting here, even though you don't realize it, and it's helping keep your body at a constant temperature. Okay? So we want to talk about the things that may make it harder to keep ourselves cool through sweating or the things that keep us from um, sweating at all. And so some of those things are the temperature itself outside. This is pretty common sense. The hotter it is outside, the harder it is for us to keep ourselves cool especially if that temperature gets above about 99 degrees. Our body is around 98, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And so if it gets above that outside, we start absorbing heat from the, the little air outside. And that makes it harder for us to keep cool. Another thing would be the sunshine. When the sun is bright and beaming down on you, especially on a hot day, it doesn't feel good, does it? Right? I'll, I've seen you guys outside during the heat. Like, you guys are, like, walk, like looking ahead at your path, like, trying to, like, just stay in the shade, right? Like, I've seen 50 people lined up, like, all walking like this, you know, real, trying to just stay in the shade because it's hot, right? People do it in amusement parks all the time. They try to avoid the sun because it makes it worse. And then, finally, it's the, there's humidity. Humidity is how much water is dissolved in the air. Right now, there's water literally dissolved in the air. You can't see it, but it's there. The air can only hold so much water. The the more water that's dissolved in this air that we have, the higher the humidity is. And when there's so much water in the air, it makes it really hard for us to sweat, our sweat to evaporate and keep ourselves cool. Okay? If sweat's not evaporating into the air, it's not pulling heat away from your body, and so you stay hot. So humidity makes it a lot harder for that sweat to actually keep us cool. Georgia has very high humidity. It doesn't have the highest temperatures, but it has a very high humidity, and it feels really warm here. You can go out west where temperatures are higher, and don't get me wrong, 100, 110 degrees is hot, but it's a drier heat out there, and so it feels different. It feels different. Even though it's still hot, it feels different. And so if you're still not sure about humidity, it's the days you open up the door outside and it feels like something hits you in the face, right? Like when you're going outside, your glasses fog up, or like you feel like you can eat the air, right? You know what I'm talking about? Right, like you actually feel like you need it. That's humidity, and it makes it harder to keep ourselves cool. One of the biggest things, though, that you can do to help yourselves make sure you can keep yourself cool and keep sweating is to make sure you don't become dehydrated, okay? To make sure you don't come, become dehydrated, which means we need to make sure that we're drinking enough water. What's the easiest way for us to tell whether we're hydrated enough or not? Okay, so there's weird things out there that people talk about, about looking at knuckles or this, that, and the other, or some voodoo magic stuff. Like, just forget about all that, and let's go the easy way. So we just simply need to look at your urine. There are some official tests we could do with urine, like looking at different things with it, but you don't need that. We simply, when we look at your urine, need to know, look at one thing with your urine to kind of tell whether you're hydrated enough. What do you think that is? Color. The color. The color. If we look at the color of your urine, we can start telling kind of where your hydration level stands. It's not 100% foolproof, but it's pretty accurate. Um, I like to play a game every time I urinate. Throughout my entire life, like every single day, the one, you know, once or twice a day I urinate, whatever, I like to play a game of what color's my urine, right? Like it's a game to me. And then we're going to see if I get it right or wrong, and I get to play, am I hydrated or not? So if you're well hydrated, 
what color do you think your urine should be? Clear to a light yellow. Okay, clear to a light yellow. Now, when we say clear, your pee should not be clear enough for you to pee into a smart water bottle and convince someone that it's real water, okay? You can be overhydrated, okay? It shouldn't be that you can bottle it and sell it as water, okay? That's a little too much, but clear to a light yellow. As you start to become a little dehydrated, nothing maybe to overly concerned about, what color do you think your urine starts to turn? Not necessarily a darker yellow, but think like bright yellow, right? Like almost turns like a lemonade color. That might be a sign that you need a little bit more water, but it could be okay as well, right? It's just kind of that urge of like, eh, if this goes much worse, it could be bad. As we, as we start to become dehydrated where it's more of a concern, it turns what color, sir? It starts turning a darker yellow, right? Like a darker mustardy yellow, like something really dark where you're like, eh, that doesn't look so great, right? At that point, we definitely need to make sure we're consuming more water to kind of rehydrate. If we continue to ignore that, or we continue to become dehydrated, what color do you think your urine would, would start to turn? Orange. Or okay, so orange is kind of a weird thing. That's some kind of chemical you've eaten. Hopefully it's not turning orange. Um, I, heard, I thought I said, heard someone say red. Red is not a great color when it comes to urine. That's like blood in the urine. Also like a, a brown could be blood in the urine. So that's a concern as well. But typically if you become really dehydrated, your urine will turn a really, really darker, dark, dark yellow, or even actually the color of sweet tea or Coke. It could actually turn that color. Yeah, ooh, right? If, you're, if your urine is the color of Coke or tea, you just need to go to the hospital. That's really, really dehydrated, and you just need to go there to have them give you an IV, which is literally just pouring water into your, into your blood vessels. You're not going to drink yourself out of that one, right? Does that make sense? But it can happen. So when it comes to that, realize for hydration, water is typically fine. Even if you've been exercising, water is fine. Most people do not need sports drinks like Powerade and Gatorade in order to stay hydrated, Okay. Sports drinks like Powerade and Gatorade are meant for people who are working outside, doing exercise outside for three, four hours at a time in a really hot, humid environment. So like 90 degrees with like 80% humidity for three, four, five hours. Those people need a sports strength. If you work in an industry like construction where you're outside doing heavy labor eight hours a day, you might need a sports strength each day. For you who go outside and do a 30 minute walk on the sidewalk or 20 minutes or an hour in the gym on a treadmill, you don't need a sports strength. You don't need to go down that 64 ounce Gatorade after your 20 minute walk, okay? It's not needed. Now, I'm all for Gatorade. I think it tastes delicious. Fruit punch is the best flavor, okay? It's fact. Um, but that being said, if you like it, enjoy it, drink it like anything else, but don't feel like you have to need it because all it does is add extra calories to your diet that you don't necessarily need. Some people will work out for 20 minutes and maybe burn 20 calories and they'll drink their Gatorade that has 200 calories in it. And all of a sudden, they'd been better off just to not work out and drink that Gatorade at all. Does that make sense? Right? So we have that going on. If you start getting too warm, especially as it relates to exercise, the first sign you might have would be heat cramps. So literally, your body's getting a little too hot and your muscles start cramping up. Sometimes people ignore these because they may think they're just a normal cramp. It's not uncommon for people to get cramps. And so these may go away on their own. If you're exercising, these heat cramps should go away when you stop exercising. As soon as you stop exercising, your muscles start getting cooler, those should go away. Um, however, not everyone gets heat cramps, and so your body may start getting too hot on the inside, and eventually this will lead to heat exhaustion. This is where our body starts to shut down a little bit because it's getting too hot. You may have trouble like remembering things or talking, may have some just maybe stumbling a little bit, just having a little bit of trouble with things that should be pretty easy. But a lot of people, if they're by themselves, don't realize they may ha they have heat exhaustion. Their mind's not functioning properly. And so if their body gets even warmer, eventually they'll hit heat stroke, okay? And heat stroke is very dangerous. Heat stroke is where the inside of your body gets so hot that your brain literally starts to cook inside your skull. So think about a steak putting it on a grill, how that changes the color and how the texture of it. The same thing would happen to your brain when you start getting too hot and hitting heat stroke. It starts to cook inside your skull. Does the color change? The, I don't know if the yeah, color changes or not. Like, I, I don't really know. I haven't like cut someone's head open after heat stroke. It'd be a cool experiment. Yeah. I don't think I'd get signed off for. Um, but uh, imagine it's going to start to pull apart proteins. 
and it's going to start damaging the brain. And so this is where people may start um, shivering when it's hot outside, when they're really, really hot, right? And so it's going to affect the brain. So think about anything that doesn't seem right, like the brain's not functioning right, could be a sign of heat stroke if it's really hot outside and they've been exercising in that, okay? Um, the biggest thing when it comes to heat stroke is we're affecting the brain and we're damaging the brain. Does brain matter regrow after it's been damaged? I was, I was about to ask if it was permanent. Ah, good. Good question. What do you think? Does brain matter regrow? I've heard it does, but like very, very, very slowly. Okay, so there are certain parts of some things in our brain that may make some different connections, but typically when we've injured the brain, it's either very slow or almost never recovers. Your brain's not a, a, like your skin. It doesn't regrow like your skin and repair itself, and we don't know if something's there. These effects typically are relatively permanent. Not all aspects of it, but severe heat stroke can lead to big permanent changes. Does that mean like the folds in your brain like is that what he, like you're implying by that, or is it? So he's asking if the like the folds in the brain, which is kind of where the you know, connections like happen, area is a big like surface area. So it's not yeah. as much of that. Of your your brain is protein, okay? And proteins are basically think about like ribbon, right? Ribbon that's kind of set in a certain way and compacted and turned and twisted to make a certain structure. What happens is when your brain gets too hot, that ribbon kind of starts to straighten out. Now we might still have the ridges in the brain. But the way those proteins actually work, stop working in the way they should. Does that make sense? Right? And there's no easy way for us to get them twisted back and put back together correctly after they've kind of undone that. It's a very loaded question, but I don't think yeah, your, your brain doesn't get like smooth as like a, <laughs> like a, you know, a polished boulder. Yeah. It's not going to be like that. Just the internals of it kind of degrade over time. Does that make sense? So if you think someone's getting too hot, if you think someone's hitting heat stroke or heat exhaustion maybe even there, what are some things we can do to maybe help alleviate this? What are some things that we can do to help this where maybe it's not as damaging as it could be? Drink water. Okay, so A, we can get them to drink water. Maybe they're dehydrated for sure. What'd you say? So a cool rag, putting that on them for sure. What should we 100% get them to stop doing? So moving. Anytime we move muscles, it's gonna cause heat to be produced. So exercising, stopping. So get them to stop moving, start so to stay still for sure. What are some other things that could be helpful? Okay, moving them to air conditioning or at least into some shade, right? Don't let them bake in the sun for sure. Make sure they're sweating. Okay, looking to see if they're sweating. That's a good sign to see. And then, so if they're not sweating, what's a, another way we could maybe cool them off? You guys are doing good. What's another way? If they're not wet, right? We know that. Some water on there. Okay, we can pour water on them. Spray them down with a garden hose. Hopefully it's cool water. That could cool them down. What do you think the very best thing you can do to someone who's experiencing heat stroke is? What's the most effective way? Call the folks? What folks? Okay, so yeah, we, we'd want to call 911, but it's going to take them a while to get there. There's one thing we can do that will help drop their temperature almost instantly and will help them go from heat stroke to we're not concerned about heat stroke at all. Put him in a kiddie pool, close, but in that kiddie pool, we want to make sure, as he said, an ice bath. Literally an ice bath. We want to make a, a giant tub full of ice water and get them submerged up into their neck. You do that, it's going to take someone who's heat stroke, like their brain's cooking, to almost instantly bring their body temperature down so we're no longer worried about the brain being damaged any further. Now, if you do that, that doesn't mean they don't need to call a hot, go to the hospital. They still do need to go but it's going to stop it from progressing any further. That's the very best thing, but anything to get them cool is going to be effective. Make sense? The other thing we're worried about is the cold. Um, when it comes to the cold in Georgia, there's like one day, maybe two days a year that we're actually worried about the cold. And typically when it comes to exercising in the cold, you guys just stay inside on those cold days. But maybe you move somewhere where it's colder more often and you're going to exercise outside. The biggest thing we're worried about is something called hypothermia. Hypothermia is the opposite of heat stroke. It's where the body gets too cold and literally starts to shut down. Um, when it comes to hypothermia, what can we do for someone who might be getting too cold on the inside? What could we have this person do? Or what could we do to help this person with their hypothermia? Bring them inside. Typically, you guys aren't exercising in places where there's not an indoors. If you are, hopefully you have some equipment for this. So maybe it's starting a fire, that type of thing. But bring them inside. What would you say? Okay, making sure they're dressed appropriately, right? So having a jacket on them, yes, that is great. Um, also, we can have them exercise. Exercising raises your body temperature. 
That's the reason we sweat. So having them exercise some could help raise that. More than likely, what would happen in, um, especially in Georgia, is <coughs> not getting hypothermia. We'd actually be more worried about frostbite. And frostbite is where um, the distant parts of your body start to get so cold that the blood flow shuts off. So think about tips of your fingers, tips of your toes, your nose, your ears. They're outside so long that blood flow stops to them. And if blood flow stops to an area, what happens? It dies. It dies. So typically, um, we could actually have um, a body part or a piece of a body part die, and you need to go to the hospital, and I'll probably have to cut that off. Typically, though, we should be able to avoid frostbite, especially in Georgia if we're close to somewhere indoors. If a body part ever goes numb or starts to tingle because it's been outside for so long and gotten so cold, you should go inside and allow those body parts to warm up. It's really that simple, right? The key with the cold is we have to realize there are two things that make the cold worse, besides just the temperature itself. When it's cold outside, there's two things that make it bad. The first one is the wind. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like, it could be 20 degrees outside, and you walk outside, no wind, and you're like, well, that's not that bad. And then the slightest breeze blows across your body, and you're like, I'm out, yeah. right? 40-degree day, a breeze with a 40-degree day, you guys are like, nah, it feels like it's 10, right? The wind makes it colder. What else makes the cold worse? Do what? Rain. rain, so wet, water. If you get wet in the cold, have you ever been wet when it's cold outside? And then the wind blows on you while you're wet. And the wind blows <laughs> on you while you're wet, like it's done, done, right? Because what, what the water and the wind do is they take body heat away from you. They literally get rid of your body heat. So making sure you stay dry. If you get wet, go inside and get dry clothes on. Yes, sir? Uh, sometimes I just notice when it rains, it feels a little warm. Like, so... So it could be the fact that sometimes that maybe it just feels like it's warmer and it's not. Sometimes it could be that, um, let's say, you're so cold, your body's so cold, that it feels warm because the water is warmer than the outside air. But it's still colder. But it's still colder than what you probably need. Also, sometimes in the winter, because of the way the atmosphere works, sometimes it could actually, the rain is actually warmer than what it is, what your the air temperature is. And so it could be adding some heat to it. It also could be making it colder depending on how the atmosphere is working. Are we good here? Makes sense. There's a couple other things we want to note about um, some, some safety things. First of all is air quality. Air quality can be a bad thing, especially if you suffer from asthma. In the summer, you know those days we have the smog alerts. And like in the middle of the day, you look out over the city of Atlanta, and it looks like a brown hue, right? The air quality is bad. It's full of pollution, and that can be really bad if you have um, asthma or things like that. So what could you do to help avoid that air quality being an issue, especially in the summer? Move away from the city. So moving away from the city could help you, for sure. Exercising uh, further outside the city, definitely. What else? Work outside. Okay. Avoid outdoors, right? Work out indoors. That could be there. Also, we can work out early, early in the morning or late in the evening, and air quality is typically better. <clears throat> When it comes to exercising, if you exercise for any period of time, you're likely to have some type of injury along the way. If you've been exercising for years, at some point you're going to have some injury. Nothing necessarily major. It could be something minor. But with injuries that have to do with the head, your eyes, ligaments, uh, broken bones, or anything internally that you can't really tell what's going on, you definitely want to go see your doctor. But for minor injuries, maybe you pull a muscle, maybe you um, kind of roll your ankle and sprain it, or, or just some general injuries, maybe cut, something like that. Um, typically what we say is you want to rice those injuries before you go see the doctor. Now, when we say rice, we don't mean put it in a bag of white rice like you do your cell phone when you drop it in the toilet, okay? That's not going to help any kind of joint injury, soaking it in rice. What we mean is that you want to rest it. Allow that body part to rest and have time to repair Apply ice to the injury, 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off for several hours each day to help with the swelling and the pain and the healing process. Um, you can compress it with an ace bandage, so trying to push excess fluid out of the area. Sometimes just the swelling, that excess fluid, is painful, and pushing that out just makes it feel a little bit better. And then finally, elevating it. Elevating it above the heart if possible, but just keeping it elevated so that fluid doesn't build up in the area. Right, the typical first aid kind of things that we have. At the end of all of this, we would rather prevent injuries than having to deal with them. 
injuries make it harder for us to continue to move. It makes it harder um, for a lot of things, and so we'd rather prevent those. And so ways to prevent injuries are to train regularly. If you're training a couple days a week, kind of like that maintenance stage, you're going to prevent injuries. You're going to keep your muscles strong to help you prevent those. Make sure that you increase slowly. So many times you're doing something more and more, just do it at a nice gradual way. Right. Don't jump too much or you're likely to get injured. Get plenty of rest. So that means taking days off where you don't exercise, but also means sleeping well. Your body heals when you sleep. So if you're not getting enough sleep, it could be an issue um, and lead to injuries. Make sure you get plenty of fluids to stay hydrated. So we're typically saying water. Um, you know, tequila, vodka, that type of thing doesn't count as a fluid when it comes to staying hydrated. Okay? They will dehydrate you. Uh, make sure that you do a proper warm up and cool down before you exercise and after you exercise. Always make sure you do something with proper technique and equipment. Okay? Even walking, if you walk incorrectly, can lead to an injury over time. Okay? There are lots of kids who um, don't necessarily walk the best way. And over time, that can lead to knee injuries and hip injuries and ankle injuries, okay? So making sure you're looking at that. Um, all of you would very quickly notice, like, if I was walking, you know, like, throwing my legs out to the side like this, well, I'm very likely to get injured with that, right? That actually hurts my knees just doing it now. And so we have to make sure that you're doing something properly. Um, and then finally, when you're sick, don't feel like you have to exercise. Most sicknesses are not made better with exercise, okay? Okay. Um, the only caveats to that could be like a head cold or something where it's just kind of up in your nose. Sometimes moving actually will help clear that up and make you feel better. But most of the time, most sicknesses, you just need to take some time off and let your body heal. Okay? Um, this includes things like the runs and the squirts, like if you have the upset stomach. If you go for a run with the runs, you're just going to ruin a good pair of pants. Right? You know what I'm saying? Like just, just use some common sense there. Um, and so always look at those things. Questions? You guys good with this? Cool. We have finished chapter three.